I'm going to be talking about how we go about building a party for the working class in the U.S., um, taking as my starting point Jared Abbott and Dustin Guastella's, our very own, uh, party surrogate model, um, and adding to it three additional points. Uh, so first I'll start with a little bit of background. Um, the U.S. is unique uh, among developed democracies in the total domination of its political system at all levels by only two major parties. Um, the result of this two-party system is that the workers' movement in the U.S. has much less room to maneuver in terms of electoral politics than such movements in other countries. So, for example, in a country like Denmark or Portugal, you know, there are three or four political parties explicitly oriented towards the working class with a good shot at representation in the legislature. In the U.S., there isn't even one. Um, this means that in the U.S., even more so than in the rest of the developed world, the working class is shut out of electoral politics. Um, most elections in this country do not represent contests between different classes, but rather the stage-managed alternation in power between the two wings of America's hegemonic party of capital. Um, so this puts and has historically put the American left in a difficult position. Um, if we don't have a party of our own, <coughs> beg your pardon, how do we go about building one? Um, and the two traditional poles of this debate have been, on the one hand, those advocating sustained entrism into the Democratic Party, and on the other hand, those advocating the immediate formation of a third party that will contest elections exclusively on its own uh, ballot line. This debate ebbed a little bit uh, while the left had a Bernie Sanders campaign to rally around, uh, not just the DSA, but even Socialist Alternative, um, which in other respects is quite insistent on the third party strategy, uh, endorsed Sanders' campaign. Um, but his failure in 2020 has reopened the question. Um, the, the major problem is that neither of these stances has much to recommend it. Um, the problem with the interest approach, which is, well, we don't have a workers party, the easiest way to get one is just to enter the Democratic Party and turn it into a workers party, um, is that it's a recipe for demobilization and co-optation. Um, we can see that in the wake of Bernie's defeat, the diverse coalition that he brought together has not radicalized and consolidated, but has instead largely melted away, um, in large part due to the absence of a dedicated workers party to cohere it. Um, on the other hand, the problem with the immediate third party strategy is that it's failed for every third party of the left or the right that has tried it for about a century or more. Um, recognition of the inadequacy of the Democratic Party interest strategy should not blind us to the fact that the structural impediments to third party politics in the United States are just as severe today as they have ever been. So we're left with the conclusion that neither of these strategies is good. In fact, they're both terrible. Um, so what do we do? The way out of the impasse. Um, the core of the left's failure to resolve this problem has been its conflation of the concepts of a party and a ballot line. These are two separate things. And the first step in the order of operations is not to settle the question of which ballot line to be using, but to build a true party. Um, this is where uh, a certain uh, gentleman uh, of a Sicilian persuasion, who may or may not be presently among us, uh, ha has intervened. Um, by writing or co-writing uh, or co-developing um, something called the party surrogate model, which is laid out in uh, the article A Socialist Party in Our Time by Jared Abbott and Dustin Guastella in Catalyst. Um, what this model calls for is the, for, is the formation uh, of a new party modeled on the mass parties in the 19th and early 20th, 20th centuries, which they describe as, quote, highly organized membership associations in which members were not only expected to pay dues, but also had party responsibilities and were expected to participate in the daily life of the organization, end quote. Um, the party surrogate, uh, as they envision it, has certain key differences with something like the DSA, at least in its present incarnation. Uh, it would act like a party because it would have a democratically decided party platform, it would work to elect only candidates that are members of the organization, and it would create movements rather than follow after them. This is actually a common structure for, all, for a lot of political parties around the world, but it's almost unheard of in the American context. Um, the point, or one of the points of the party surrogate model is that you have to go about building an actual party with meat on its bones before you should really start worrying too much about which ballot line you're going to be using. Um, you need to build that entire ecosystem of institutions. 
<coughs> so not just electoral institutions for selecting and, and disciplining candidates, um, but other forms of non-electoral institutions as well. Publications, meeting halls where people go to get drunk after work, uh, the provision of social services in some uh, cases. Um, you know, the gold standard for this sort of party in the developed world was the old German SPD um, before, it, before it went to shit. Um, but if you go to the developing world, you can find all sorts of uh, particularly communist parties that still engage in this sort of activity um, and that still have something approaching a mass base as a result. So this gets you your mass base, your mass party. Um, and then with that mass base, you'll have more room to maneuver on the question of the ballot line. Um, because you'll have a loyal block of voters who will follow you no matter which ballot line you're using. Um, I think this is a straightforwardly rational plan, and it's encouraging that the party surrogate model seems to be getting a lot of traction. Um, there are a couple of areas where I think uh, it could stand to be sharpened, though, and that'll be the rest of the talk. Um, so these areas are, one, the question of the ballot line. Again, sorry, but <laughs> you didn't think you'd escaped it. Um, number two is the question of candidate discipline and conflict of interest within the party. And the third is the question of electoral reform. Uh, so let's start with the ballot line question. I just got done saying that the point of the party surrogate model is that it lets you postpone the question of the ballot line. Um, unfortunately, a lot of people have interpreted that postponement to be indefinite or definitive. Um, there's a distinction to my mind between saying the party surrogate model gives us the latitude to experiment with the use of different ballot lines according to practical or strategic considerations within the context of an overall long-term strategy of building our own workers' party and saying, on the other hand, that the party surrogate model tells us it's okay to just be Democrats forever. Um, there's a section of the DSA's activist stratum in particular that really does just want to be Democrats. And they seem to have glommed onto the party surrogate model as a way to just be Democrats while branding what they're doing as something a bit more avant-garde. Um, I think this is a misinterpretation of the party, party surrogate model, though maybe Dustin disagrees, um, and of the political situation as well. Um, so I can give you guys an example of what it looks like when you evacuate the party surrogate model of any points of differentiation from the standard old Harringtonite realignment strategy. Um, the Collective Power Network, which is a DSA caucus, explicitly rejects even the long-term goal of an independent socialist workers party and seeks instead to redefine the party surrogate model as another strategy for realignment. They say, quote, a loyal mass base large enough to allow for a dirty break, by which they mean secession of the socialist element from within the Democratic Party and forming its own party, um, while avoiding electoral marginalization, will necessarily require a majority of Democratic voters and be powerful enough to dominate in Democratic primaries. By the time a dirty break could be successful, the debate over realignment of the Democratic Party versus the dirty break would be irrelevant. At that point, it doesn't matter what ballot line we use, we'd already be delivering all the material results of the working class that we can through electoral organizing and parliamentary strategy, end quote. Um, I think this argument is seriously flawed. Um, the party surrogate could very well amass a loyal base large enough to allow for it to contest elections on a non-democratic ballot line without that basis constituting a majority of democratic primary voters. In fact, I think it's quite likely that the party surrogate would cross the first threshold before the second in many regions of the country. This is due to two related features of the American political system. The first is that the working class participates in primary elections at much lower rates than it participates in general elections and at much lower rates than other classes or strata participate in primary elections. And second, that those members of the working class who do vote in primary elections are divided between the primaries of the two major parties. Um, the mass base of a strong socialist party is drawn principally from the ranks of the working class, whereas the base of a liberal party like the Democrats is drawn principally from the professional stratum and the upper middle class, particularly in primaries. Uh, this means that our socialist party surrogate is likely to underperform in democratic primaries compared to those general elections in which its candidates are perceived as viable by the broader electorate. Um, and I think evidence of this is if you look at what happened to Bernie Sanders, who lost two Democratic primaries, despite being the most popular politician in the country, due to the fact that a large share of the predominantly working class voters who would have happily voted for him in a general election, um, be that against Hillary Clinton or Donald Trump or possibly against Joe Biden, I'm not entirely sure who would have won in a general election between Bernie and, and Biden, but um, in any event, um, they, they did not vote in the Democratic primaries that he contested either because they didn't vote in a primary at all, or they voted in the Republican primary, or they were disenfranchised by the closed primary systems that, that exist in a lot of states. Um, 
Furthermore, the Democratic Party establishment has embarked on a long-term effort to jettison even lip service to class and popular left economics, instead embracing austerity and pivoting to consolidate the support of Wall Street and Silicon Valley. Um, through gutting labor unions and encouraging communitarian patronage politics in lieu of mass politics, the working class sectors of its voter base amenable to socialism are being marginalized while the party woos neoconservatives and the formerly Republican wealthy suburbs and major cities. Um, the Democratic primary electorate is therefore becoming less receptive to socialist politics relative to the population as a whole, um, which has been moving to the left on economic issues. Um, and I don't mean that they're becoming less receptive in absolute terms. I think generally the entire, um, the entire population is slowly moving leftwards on economic issues, but um, the Democratic primary electorate is importing these economically conservative voters in large numbers. And that is, I think, mitigating the leftward drift. Um, and so... The realignment strategy proposed above leaves us at the mercy of the very democratic establishment that we'd like to see overthrown. Um, not only is this establishment more than capable of stealing primary elections, as we saw in Iowa in 2020, it has considerable latitude to intentionally drive our preferred voters out of its own primaries by adopting and publicizing stances that they find loathsome or obnoxious. Um, this has the potential to leave us in the unenviable position of trying to corral working class voters back into the primaries of a party that clearly doesn't want them around, um, or of making concessions to appeal to the Democrats' disproportionately anti-socialist upper middle class primary electorate and liquidating our political project in the process. Um, so all that said, we need to have some sort of plan in place for escaping from the Democratic Party. Um, and we need to be able to start taking those steps now, even as we continue to contest its primaries. Um, an abstract commitment to independence from the Democrats is not going to be enough. Um, we need to develop structures capable of resisting the gravitational pull of both of the major parties while opportunistically exploiting their ballot lines. Um, in addition, we will need to prioritize reforms to the electoral system that will allow socialists to run on our, on our own ballot line, not at some unspecified point in the ever receding future, but as soon as specific reforms have been achieved in a given jurisdiction. Um, Abbott and Guastella primarily discussed the use of the Democratic ballot line in their formulation of the party surrogate model, and this makes sense. Um, the Democratic line is the obvious choice from a tactical perspective in most parts of the country uh, due to existing links to the working class and to unions. Um, but it's precisely for this reason that we must take special care to avoid over-reliance on it. Um, the party surrogate must commit itself to running on a third party line as an independent or even on the Republican line where local circumstances warrant it. Running on the Republican line might seem unorthodox, but it is unavoidable if we are serious in our desire to opportunistically exploit the American primary system, rather than becoming yet another impotent leftwards appendage of the Democrats. In many districts that are thoroughly Republican controlled, only the GOP primary is even worth contesting. And there are already examples of socialists experimenting with this strategy, though I'll admit not particularly successfully. Um, the Republican Party is also much weaker at coordinating to block candidates making openly hostile use of its ballot line than the Democratic Party is. Um, this is what Trump accomplished in 2016 and what the Tea Party did almost a decade before, running against the Republican establishment with the promise of rebuilding the party. Um, finally, this tactic has precedent. The Nonpartisan League employed it with considerable success in the upper Midwest in the 1920s and 30s, uh, giving rise to state level third parties that briefly broke the two party duopoly uh, in Minnesota and North Dakota. Um, most of our candidates are not going to be running on the Republican ballot line, probably ever. Um, ballot line should be decided by the Socialist Party surrogate at the state or local level. Um, but I think the tactic of running on the Republican line could prove beneficial, even if employed in moderation, um, as it would signal, uh, you know, it, it serves socialist goals and clearly delineate how our socialist project differs from more traditional attempts to work within the Democratic Party. Um, so it would create a real outside to the inside outside strategy. Um, it would establish an unambiguously antagonistic relationship to both the Democratic and Republican parties as interchangeable capitalist parties. Um, on the outside, this will be crucial for persuading and mobilizing the entire working class, including the working class that feels more affinity with the Republicans than with the Democrats. On the inside, it lends friction to the revolving door between us and the Democratic Party's consultant class. Um, uh, just to give an example of how this might work, the Socialist Party surrogate runs candidates in both the Democratic and Republican primaries simultaneously. You ask voters at the door which party they affiliate with and you give them the relevant pitch. If only one of the candidates makes it to the general, you throw all the weight behind him or her. If both make it to the general, you know, that's a great opportunity for the sort of joint, we're all in this together, we're fighting for the working class messaging, um, where both of the candidates can basically, you know, be on each other's side. Um, 
Uh, so with that out of the way, um, I'll move on to the, my second point, which is about candidate discipline and conflict of interest. Um, an essential function of the party surrogate and what differentiates it most clearly from uh, the, the DSA's present electoral strategy um, is that it depends on holding politicians and candidates to its chosen platform. Um, at the most basic level, a socialist politician must be subject to the discipline of a socialist organization in order to prevent them from being seduced by the trappings of money and power. Um, the single greatest threat to socialist electoral efforts in the United States at the moment is the danger of co-optation by the Democratic Party, including its progressive wing, which can apply tremendous pressure on politicians and activists alike. And, you know, we, we don't have to look far for examples. Uh, who knows what AOC is going to be saying at any given moment? Um, you know, she's, she's clearly, you know, running her own shop at the moment. Um, but this, this applies to many, many DSA elected officials around the country. Um, a socialist party... A socialist party that intends to run dozens or hundreds of candidates for public office around the country cannot afford to operate under a model where politicians are simply taken at their word to be good and earnest socialists. Um, we need to establish norms and procedures that would allow the socialist party surrogate to exercise direct control over its elected officials. Um, in concrete terms, that means a few things. First, candidates should be drawn from the ranks of the socialist party surrogate and allied socialist organizations. Candidate must pledge to abide by and implement a comprehensive minimum maximum party program. All political staffing positions should be approved by the party surrogate, as would decisions on votes and proposed legislation. Elected officials should forfeit a, per a portion of their salary to the party surrogate and allied socialist organizations, giving up all money in excess of what a skilled worker earns in their district. In any situation where multiple party surrogate members are elected to a legislative body, they must be required to form a caucus and vote as a block. In other words, the party surrogate must adopt a policy of accountability and collective decision making equivalent to democratic centralism for its elected officials specifically. Um, that might seem to be a bit of a radical uh, model, um, but it's actually been the norm in socialist and social democratic parties worldwide at a variety of historical junctures. Um, even ordinary liberal parties in many parliamentary democracies uh, exhibit certain features of, of what I just said. Um, in the United States, the Trotskyist Party Socialist Alternative exercises just this sort of control over Seattle City Council member Kshama Sawant, um, who is not coincidentally by far the most effective socialist elected official in the country, barring Bernie Sanders, um, and her admirable allegiance to Socialist Alternative over her own personal career interests is unmatched by any DSA elected anywhere. Um, so I think that, uh, you know, the, the, the goal should be to try to replicate what Socialist Alternative has achieved in Seattle in cities and towns across the country. Um, and just as a workers party must impose discipline on its politicians, it must discipline the careerism of its leadership stratum as well. Um, the proportion of DSA leaders who work for or aspire to work for politicians, democratic aligned nonprofits and consulting firms is kind of staggering. Um, the phenomenon reverses the disciplinary dynamic that a socialist workers party should aspire to. Rather than the party disciplining its politicians, the political establishment disciplines the party by means of paid agents in its leadership structure. It's absolutely imperative that the DSA or any potential party surrogate uh, recognize the damaging effects of conflict of interest and respond by forbidding elected politicians, candidates for public office, and political and campaign staffers from holding leadership positions at any level within the organization. Um, by ensuring that the DSA's elected officials are not synonymous with party leadership, we can increase the broad organization's ability to exercise control and make decisions that might be costly to an individual politician, but at the same time be necessary for the health of the DSA or the Socialist Party surrogate as a whole. Um, and the last point I want to touch on is electoral reform. Um, the entire reason we have to chew on this issue of the party and the ballot line so much is that we can't just spin up our own party with our own ballot line and hit the ground running. Um, a lot of people treat this as an unchanging fact of life or of the system, um, but it would actually probably be a lot easier to reform the electoral system uh, than it would be to go to the trouble of building up a viable third party uh, under the current system. Um, so while there are many legal and structural obstacles to third party ballot viability in the United States, by far the most serious is the first past the post electoral system. Um, this and other similar uh, plurality systems give rise to a spoiler effect such that voting for a third party can inadvertently swing an election towards the voters least preferred major party. Voters are conscious of this fact and so engage in large scale tactical voting for lesser evil candidates rather than voting for their true preferences. Um, if we want to shake off our reliance on the democratic ballot line, we have to orient ourselves towards electoral reform at all levels of government. 
Um, fortunately, this is a popular issue. It has like two thirds uh, support in a lot of opinion polling. Um, and it's one of the most feasible to achieve by way of local and state level campaigns and ballot initiatives. Um, the states of Maine and Alaska have already implemented the most plausible alternative electoral system, which is ranked choice voting for most elections. Uh, similar efforts are underway in many other states and socialists should lend them our full support and help to initiate them ourselves where necessary. Um, the DSA, unfortunately, has conspicuously failed to implement any sort of nationwide electoral reform campaign or strategy. Um, opponents of an electoral reform priority within the organization frequently cite the example of the Labor Party in the United Kingdom uh, to argue that socialist or social democratic parties can indeed flourish under first past the post voting systems uh, and that our goal should be to overtake or capture the Democrats under the present electoral system. Um, the example of labor uh, in the UK is both exceptional and misleading. Um, of the four long-standing developed democracies that use plurality voting, the US, the UK, Canada, and Japan, um, the United Kingdom is the only one to have seen the emergence of a successful social, social democratic or socialist party. Um, the Socialist Party of America is long gone and they only won a few seats in Congress at their peak. The New Democratic Party in Canada has had success at the provincial level but has never formed a government at the national level. And the Japanese Communist Party, which operates under a marginally more favorable electoral system, has likewise never won a substantial number of seats in the diet. Um, by comparison, all longstanding developed democracies that use proportional electoral systems have seen the rise of social democratic, socialist, or communist major parties. Um, furthermore, UK Labour was only able to overtake the Liberal Party from which it split due to the chaotic aftermath of the First World War. Um, we can't adopt a strategy that depends on the occurrence of such tremendous social and economic upheaval to succeed. Um, we should also recommend that, thanks. Um, we should also recommend um, we should also recognize that the Labour Party's particular internal dysfunction is exacerbated by first past the post. The Labour right has been able to sabotage the party and crush its socialist wing uh, by means of a fake anti-Semitism smear campaign, but the Labour left is disincentivized to simply secede and start a new party because such a party would face tremendous headwinds under first past the post. Uh, this dynamic abets the capture of socialist and social democratic parties by liberal wreckers who know that the party's captive electorate cannot readily defect at the polls. Um, Winning electoral reform at the local and state level is therefore of crucial importance, I think, to any successful party surrogate model. Um, due to the nature of the US Constitution, the most plausible method of proportional representation is the single transferable vote form of ranked choice voting, uh, which can be implemented on a state by state basis. Um, this is the system used in Ireland, where you've got left party Sinn Féin currently as the largest party, um, and it's only the only country on earth that has Trotskyist parties in its legislature. Um, on the way to STV, instant runoff voting, which is basically the same system in single member districts, uh, is a very achievable waypoint. Um, once STV or instant runoff voting has been achieved in a given jurisdiction, um, the Socialist Party uh, can begin to run candidates on our own ballot line in the same races where we're running candidates on the Democratic or Republican lines. Um, if our primary challengers fail in those parties, we simply transfer the campaign operation to the Socialist ballot line candidate in the general election. Um, this will allow us to reach sectors of the electorate that are not activated during major party primaries and eventually to win elections on our own ballot line. Uh, so with that, I'm done. Uh, thanks for uh, your attention. And um, yeah, I'm, I'm eager to hear what you have to say, Dustin. Thanks. Thank you, Jamal. I'm going to turn it over to Dustin. And like last time, attendees, feel free to start using the Q&A tool to submit written questions that you will then be allowed to, time permitting, ask over live audio. All right, thanks. Um, Jamal, thanks for that. And and I read your paper and I, um, you know, I'm, I'm very both flattered and happy that people are taking this issue very seriously. I think the, the question of the parties and party democracy and American democracy are very important questions for the left to grapple with. However, I'm afraid my response is going to be very unsatisfactory uh, for you at least. Uh, and that's because I, I don't think uh, the core of the problem has much to do with realign, break, reform, or these other things. I think the core of the problem is pretty simple, which is that we don't have a constituency. And without a constituency, we are stranded politically, no matter what organization we're in, whether it's its own party, whether it's uh, organization inside the Democratic Party, et cetera, et cetera. Right now, I think DSA has maybe 80,000, maybe 100,000 members. Let's be generous and say it has 100,000 members. Uh, the Working Families Party probably has less than that, but significantly more money. So let's say they amount to 200,000 
members. And then the voting public is probably what, like, let's say there's a few million people who identify as some type of democratic socialist. A single congressional district has 710, 711,000 people in it. That's one congressional district. There are 435 of them. Uh, this is a very significant uh, problem for us, which is to say that we have outsized weight in a few particular cities, and we have an extremely outsized weight in the media and in the academy, but we have almost no, and by that I don't mean that we're, we're um, influencing, like the media is socialist. What I mean is that the appearance of socialism in the United States is given a lot of weight by the media, which, which spends a great deal of time focusing on organizations like DSA that are one-tenth the size of you know, what a real political organization would need to be if it was going to be a serious uh, threat to the political system. So I think this is our biggest problem. And until we can figure out a way out of that problem, I think the questions of realignment, break, or these other things are secondary. Now you point to a very real phenomenon, which is to say that, you know, if we do not think seriously about these issues, then we risk, you know, just becoming kind of the milk toast left wing of the Democratic Party, or, you know, we, we risk kind of watering down our horizons as much as possible uh, to fit within that, the existing liberal party. All right, yes, that's absolutely true. But there's no guarantee, and there, there never has been a guarantee, that independence does anything to stop this. Independence uh, from the party, or from any party, has never led to either a distinctly, distinct radicalism over time, nor success. These are three independent variables. Sometimes independence can lead to radicalism and success. Sometimes independence can lead to success, but not radicalism. And by independence, I mean having our own party. The obvious truth of this is borne out in the entire history of the social democratic parties in, in Western Europe, right? These were independent. These were mass parties. These were working class parties. All of them moderated their programs to a dramatic, dramatic degree. And th that's not a function of them being co-opted by a liberal party. It's a function of them navigating what is a very normal problem for any electoral party, which is they have to figure out how to win elections. And when you have to figure out how to win elections, you're going to moderate in certain parts of your program. You're going to figure out where to, to maximize your influence. And in that same period, when those parties moderated, new parties sprang up, right? And those parties like, for instance, Die Linke in, in Germany or um, uh, Podemos in Spain, Syriza in Greece, and all of these parties run into the exact same problem, right? With much more favorable uh, political systems than the United States or England, they run into the exact same problem. And that problem, again, to me, comes back to a lack of a working class constituency. So you look at Podemos, you look at Syriza, you look at um, Syriza, maybe less so, but you look at Podemos and you look at Die Linke, Die Linke especially, uh, Delinka is an activist organization made up of largely very well-educated, very urban uh, middle-class youth, and youth in particular. That not at all unlike DSA, right? Very, very similar to DSA. And this is where I, I guess I'll, I'll maybe be a little provocative here. I don't want a party of our own if that's our party. And if that's what, if that's what the constituency of the left is right now, that is what a party of our own would be. It would be dominated by uh, a certain type of professional uh, activistist, right? And, and I think that's a problem for us. We need to have a working class constituency. Now, the, the connection between having a working class constituency and, and what comes next, I think is very significant. And this is where I think much of the discussion of mine and Jared's article kind of goes off on, on kind of misses at least a core part of what we were trying to do, which is to say that you know, for me, the, the point of a labor left a socialist or a democratic socialist movement is not, its end goal should not be its own party or its end goal should not be its own X or its own Y. Its end goal should be actually improving the lives of ordinary working class people. That should be the, the goal, right? That should be the moral maxim. And how do you do that? So you need to both win elections and implement reforms. So to me, the most important question for any political organization is what is the fastest way to win elections and implement reforms? Because when you can implement reforms that actually have a meaningful impact on people's lives, that's how you actually build 
a loyalty, a constituency, a group that actually cares about uh, what you're saying, what you're doing, and, and what you're actually trying to put forward. So to me, again, and I know it's not going to be satisfying, and I'm sure you're going to have a lot to say in, in response, but realignment or breaking with the Democratic Party is not our decision to make. It's not a tactical decision at all. It's something that either happens in a moment of severe political crisis, just like you mentioned with the Labor Party breaking from the liberals after, after World War I. In our political systems, this is not a choice. It is something that either happens uh, because of the, the political system falls apart due to a, a major crisis, or it's something that doesn't happen. And I think that we have to recognize that we are not the masters of our destiny politically, right? The people who are the masters of our destiny politically are the working class majority, right? And who they, who they prefer in government. That's who is the, the important group, right? Not, not socialists, not the leaders of a party or anything like that. So our goal, I think, as always, is how do we build a coalition, a constituency that actually supports the kind of policies we know are right? And how does that co constituency make its way into government? To me, th there's actually a very simple way of doing this, and it's to run in democratic primaries where uh, feasible and run on a left-wing economic program but moderate a lot of the kind of woke uh, progressive rhetoric that is so alienating to non-college educated people. I think that's basically the formula. I think you can do it pretty well. I think we need to demonstrate that you can do it well in rural areas as well as urban areas. And then beyond that, I wanted to say one last thing uh, and then I'll shut up. Um, one last thing about uh, the, the question of running on Republican primaries. I think this is an interesting idea and, and people have been talking about this for years. I actually participated in an election several years ago where a uh, labor leader ran in Delaware County, which is a very Republican area, ran in the Republican primary knowingly as a, a pretty liberal guy, pretty progressive guy, and with the backing of, of several local unions. Uh, and the Republican primary voters just crushed him. I mean, I think it, we have to recognize that the Republican primaries are extremely fraught ideological battles. And these people are very, many of these people are extremely conservative on all the questions. So yes, there are un undoubtedly many Republicans in uh, America who have maybe heterodox views on economics or you know, heterodox uh, approaches to, to social questions, but they are not going to be found in, I don't think they're gonna be found in Republican pr uh, primaries. So the last, um, I guess my, my challenge to you is why, when we are so, so small um, and we're so geographically segregated into major urban hubs and class segregated into basically the college educated or even more than college educated, right? The advanced degrees um, part of the, the working class why is it so important that we figure out this question of having our own independence uh, instead of figuring out the question of how do we get public goods to be fully funded? How do we get a higher minimum wage? How do we get from the world that we're living in into a world where working people have dignified lives uh, with a fairly short um, you know, path there? And to me, that's what I want to be focused on. That's what I think is the most important thing and, and not the question of, of having our own party. Thank you, Dustin. Jamal, I'm sure you have a response, so take it away. Yeah, sure. And actually, um, you, you said that I wouldn't find it satisfactory. I think that's a very satisfactory response. Um, and I agree with a lot of it. Um, but so, so what I'm arguing for, um, my argument on this subject, on the electoral strategy subject, um, I think starts from the presupposition that we all recognize that we don't have a political constituency. We don't have an organic tether to the working class at all. Um, and where I think we may disagree is that I think that staying within the universe of the Democratic Party primary as our sort of horizon, even over the short to medium term, um, is actually going to uh, pose a challenge to us in terms of building um, that organic connection to the entire working class, because the part of the, the working class, the sector of the working class that um, votes in Democratic Party primaries or that feel some degree of affinity to the Democratic Party is a small minority of the working class. Now, obviously, it's larger than the proportion of the working class that feels some sort of affinity to the Republican Party. Um, but 
in order to actually start breaking out of our current sort of demographic um, class cul-de-sac where we're really constrained to major urban metro areas um, where we basically represent a sort of more extreme version of a slice of the Democratic Party um, primary electorate, you know, tons of young people, you know, uh, particularly in gentrifying neighborhoods and major cities, um, that's a cul-de-sac. And in order to find ways out of that cul-de-sac, we're going to have to be contesting um, politically all over the country in a variety of different environments. And some of those environments, yeah, sure, run on the Democratic primary as an unwoke, you know, socially left, or sorry, um, uh, socially center left, economically very populist Democrat, and that would be our best choice. Um, but there are parts of the country where that is going to being a Democrat and adhering to not just woke democratic cultural stances, but any centrist democratic cultural stances, um, gun control, you know, abortion rights, immigration, any of that stuff uh, is going to absolutely cause you to be written off by the working class in that particular part of the country. I'm thinking particularly of parts of the country where, like Kansas, where there's no tradition of a populist democratic party of power that ever ran the state. It has been a Republican state forever. The entire working class basically in that state votes Republican primaries all the time. Now, if you want to start making headway in Kansas, um, and I fully admit that Kansas is not <laughs> the most fertile ground for us to be making headway in, but if you want to be making headway in Kansas, you basically have to find some way to get around the fact that the democratic uh, uh, electorate uh, is, is not sufficient. It's not a sufficient part of the working class to actually win anything there. Um, so in these isolated specific parts of the country, I think that we need to, to adopt a different strategy. Um, and, and you know, the closest we've ever had to a mass social base you know, in either of our lifetimes is the Bernie campaigns. And Bernie was able to have something approaching what we would like to have for ourselves because he had a message that resonated all over the country, including in places where we didn't expect it you know, to resonate. In 2016, he was proportionally strongest with rural and small town whites. In 2020, he was proportionally strongest with Hispanics. So who knows where we might be able to, un to uncover sort of a, a um, uh, an element of a populist appeal if we're actually willing to go out there and, and actually try all over the place. And in order to do that, we can't, we can't be perceived as being Democrats. Um, whether or not 70, 80% of our candidates are in practice Democrats, you know, that's probably gonna be the case, but we can't just be hunkered down in this democratic primary electorate everywhere. Um, so I guess that's that's basically what I want to say. There is one other thing. You mentioned the case of D. Linka as kind of a, a cautionary example of just a, a sort of worthless DSA style left party um, in, in Germany. I totally agree with you on the merits of D. Linka. Um, but I think that um, if you look at some other counterexamples, for example, in Portugal, which has three left-wing parties, the Socialist Party, the Left Bloc, and the Communist Party, each of those appeal to very different demographics. And you actually have uh, a political system that allows for the left to capture the urban millennial precariat, which is the left bloc, and also the conservative rural working class, which is the Communist Party. Um, and that's the sort of thing that I think um, uh, a, a, the current political system just doesn't allow, but it's the sort of thing that you really need to be able to do effortlessly um, if, if you actually want to unite the entire working class into a single uh, you know, sort of political movement. Um, so yeah, I guess that's all I want to say. Thanks so much for your comments, Dustin. Dustin, unless you have a short response, we have a question for the two of you from Catherine. We'll go ahead and let Catherine Lou ask her question. Catherine, you're allowed to unmute. I'm gonna go ahead and start to put Catherine's question out there for her, but she may want to chime in if she gets on audio. So for Jamal and Dustin, she, Catherine thinks that the future of democratic small d politics has to do with how political leaders are going to- Sorry, I'm here, I'm here. Oh, but okay. Please read, go ahead, go ahead, read, read it, read it, read it. <laughs> OK, 
Okay. Read it. Sorry, I just took a bathroom break. Sorry. Sounds good. We'll let you get um back in there. I'll read your question. Here. So small d democratic politics has to do with how political leaders are going to deal with the mass popular hatred of the PMC. For me, Catherine Liu, this is key to mass politics and can lead to an explosion of reactionary rejection of PMC politics and values, as in the case of the election of Trump. What do you think about how electoral politics fits in with this inchoate class hatred from below and pointed class hatred from above? Uh, I'll go quickly. Um, Catherine, basically, I think that um, what's happening right now is a rejection of, among working people, is a, a strong rejection of the values and the language in particular of that professional class. And let's be clear, these are the, the professional class is, they are the winners of the neoliberal economy. And yep. they may be feeling squeezed, but they are the winners of the neoliberal economy. And the losers are those who do not have a great deal of education, uh, are those who do not live in big coastal cities, and are those who are struggling largely in manual or service sector uh, jobs. My belief is that the smart thing for political leaders to do uh, is to drop most of the affect of the PMC. And that is to say to drop the woke crap. It polls very poorly. Uh, its priorities are all wacky. Um, you know, when I, I did some research on the Democratic uh, electorate in 2020, and the top five issues for working people were, not surprisingly, largely kitchen table issues. It was healthcare, um, it was wages, it was the economy, and it, you know, obviously the coronavirus had a, had a big impact on that. But the number six one was crime, and the crime in, in many working class neighborhoods has, has reached kind of uh, unheard of heights lately, or at least unheard of in the past 20 or 30 years. Uh, if you look at those who have a, a college, uh, especially an advanced degree, the top five issues were uh, racial justice, climate change, climate change twice, uh, and uh, healthcare. So, and then there, the other again was coronavirus. So these are two different worlds. These are completely two different worlds of, of people living in the same electorate, right? One is concerned about their kitchen table problems, and the other is concerned about issues that are much further from the kitchen table and much further from the, the kinds of problems that, that people are having, right? And I think the, the solution for political leaders who have any sense is to say, I'm not going to, you know, play these games with this kind of, these, this rhetoric that is so popular on the left, and I'm going to hammer home the bread and butter. Uh, it's more popular among black work, uh, working class people. It's more popular among white working class people. And it's especially more popular among Latino working class people. Yet the language that we choose to use is popular almost exclusively among highly educated white people. And it's the language of racial justice, the language of climate change, the language of all these things. And that is the language and those are the priorities that many on the political left choose to put front and center. And they are absolutely alienating. So the short answer is the these political leaders need to change uh, unless we are going to have a, a strong reaction. And the reaction is going to come uh, much, much worse than I think Trump, somebody who is much, much scarier than Trump could uh, respond to this. Um, um, well, oh, sorry, go ahead. Oh, sorry, Jamal. So one of the reasons I, I asked that question was because I feel like although many of the points in your paper were very admirable, you basically um, model a technocratic solution to the problem of class war and, and antagonism. So that's why I wanted you to add, how can we add this question of pure antagonism? Because I agree with Justin that this language that is used by the PMC, by my class, forged in my workplace, is absolutely destructive and corrosive to any possibility of building a mass constituency that we that you two are have talked about today. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that part of the reasons why, um, you know, I'm insistent on the problem of being trapped in the Democratic Party's electoral coalition and in their primaries is precisely because it traps us in an electoral environment in which the PMC are 
dominant or much more prevalent than they are in the broader population, which means that they get to make demands on our politicians to behave in a certain way um, that, yeah, if you're running in a general electorate, of course it makes no sense to talk about all this woke bullshit, right? But if you're running in a Democratic par par Party primary where the PMC is represented at, I don't know, 1.5 times its, its proportion of the, of the population in your district just because they happen to vote more regularly, um, and who knows how much more they're represented in terms of being the most energetic people, the people who are the most active canvassers and so forth, um, they can exert a lot of gravitational pull on a candidate who, who you know, might in his heart of hearts want to run on an economic message. And that, that being in that stuck in that position of having to play ball with the PMC while you're trying to reach a broad working class constituency that absolutely hates this shit and cannot stand it. Um, that's a really difficult thing to navigate. And I think we're seeing in the UK, um, or we have seen in the UK, just, just how toxic it can be to have a party that ran on a, a left-wing you know, economic platform under Corbyn, um, and, but the PMC were able to sneak in their remain plank, and that just totally shot everything to shit, right? That totally undermined the entire message um, that Corbyn was trying to get out there to the working class. And that's a tough thing to navigate if you're stuck, if you, if you're stuck with this constituency in your electorate.